Thank you for giving me the opportunity to provide this brief introduction and provide an overview of some of the results from recent studies from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory that show the potential opportunities for very large scale growth in energy storage. The first is the storage future study. In the reference scenario, which is essentially a business as usual scenario with no carbon policy, we see potential opportunities for about 200 gigawatts of economic deployments of energy storage. But this ignores the potential opportunities for more aggressive uh, cost reductions in batteries, um, and of course, more aggressive cost reductions for renewable resources. When we do perform those sensitivities, we see additional hundreds of gigawatts of additional storage capacity being deployed by the middle of the century. But the really interesting results are those associated with the decarbonization scenarios, such as those in the solar future study. In those scenarios, the base scenario, which has a approaches but not complete decarbonization of the power sector, we see deployments appro approaching 1,000 gigawatts of energy storage. And in cases where we have additional electrification uh, that would be re potentially required for deep decarbonization, we see an additional you know, several hundred gigawatts of energy storage deployment. So this is a really radical transmission transition of the power sector. Now, when we look at what the types of deployments are in the near term in the coming decade or so, these are still largely dominated by four to eight hour storage devices. Um, in the near future, these are likely going to be lithium ion batteries, um, potentially transitioning to other technologies as durations increase. Um, but we certainly see that a, a very large opportunity for continued deployments of these relatively short duration storage technologies that are used to essentially address the diurnal mismatch between the supply of solar energy, the supply of wind energy, and the demand peaks in the late afternoon and early evening. Only kind of in the out years as we approach deep, deep decarbonization do we see um, really dramatic uh, deployments of something like a 10 hour storage. And then of course, when we approach really complete decarbonization, we do see the gradual need for something like a seasonal energy storage technology. So thanks for again for the opportunity for, for me to provide that brief overview and look forward to further conversations. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Shirley Men. I'm the chief scientist for Argon Collaborative Center for energy storage science. Thank you for having me today. Um, it's my pleasure to have this opportunity to share with you some of my uh, thoughts about uh, the terawatt scale energy transition, particularly from the transportation perspective. Let me dive right in. If you look at the past 30 years of our field, we have achieved collectively a great deal. We have tripled the energy density. We have lowered the cost of lithium ion batteries more than 10 times. We have extended the cycle life from 300 to 500 cycles to a few thousand cycles. If you look at the roadmap produced by Argonne National Lab a few years ago, you can see that the usable energy density by volume and the usable energy by weight both have room to grow. In fact, most of the success, almost all the success in our field hinges on the breakthroughs in fundamental material science and engineering. Looking to the future, it is exciting time. Think about today, we have one terawatt hour production capacities, but that can only enable us to have a couple million EVs per year. In order to replace the one or two billion cars by 2035, our capability has to more than 10 times, maybe 100 times growth in the coming decade and a half. Therefore, I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about the challenges and the opportunities here. With the supply chain constraint for lithium and nickel and cobalt, Right. We have to think about alternative chemistries where we use more earth abundant materials, more homogeneous distribution and a cheaper mining and production method. The second major issue, in my opinion, are really to think about V2G, V2V and megawatt charging infrastructure for trucks and trains and think about the trucks and the trains, those commercial vehicles as one of the most important infrastructure we have as part of the grid. A third very important challenge from the materials perspective is that how can we develop 
robust and safe battery chemistries that we can actually meet the challenges of the safety demand. Today, battery safety record is the one in 10 million. But if we think about it, we are shipping out a, a few terawatt hour batteries per year, this record has to be further improved. So we have to think about how we can learn from the aviation industries to have fail safe batteries. Therefore, I think the future of the transportation is bright, but there are a lot of hard work to be done. Thank you. Hi, my name is Miguel Galeno, and I'm a research scientist at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And I'm going to talk a little bit about storage and power grid resilience. As you know, storage has this flexible capacity that help us control uncertainty. For example, in the bulk power system, uh, we can use storage to address the uncertainty of renewable generation in the day ahead or in the hours ahead. With storage participation in the energy market, we can control this uncertainty and the risk of not being able to supply the electric load. But at the same time, we know that storage can be very important to, to address other type of, of uncertainties. For example, the uncertainty associated with extreme events like floods or, uh, um, or wildfires or storms. Storage in the system uh, will help us withstand and also recover from, from, from these events and mitigating the overall um, impact in the consumers. So from the power system perspective, it's very important to make sure that utilities have the necessary uh, storage on the ground to respond to these events. At Berkeley Lab, we uh, found out that when we invest in storage in the distribution grid, particularly in a dispersed uh, uh, way, we are able to control what can happen in the worst case in a given distribution grid. When you look at the loss of load, what can happen in the worst case and all the possibilities, we can see that storage will mitigate, will push this distribution uh, to the left and mitigate the uncertainty uh, of, of, this, of these extreme events. Of course, this comes with a cost, a cost of investing in storage, which in this context can be seen as an insurance policy that we pay to guarantee that our grid is resilient. Now, a little bit different in the context of climate change, we know like temperatures uh, variation uh, in 2050, 2070 will lead to different patterns of load consumption, also different availability of resources. So when we are deploying uh, new renewables in for energy transition plans for 2050 to 2070, we have a huge uncertainty in, in the system. And we know that storage can help us decrease that, that uncertainty and provide some guarantees in terms of security of supply. The question is how to quantify that benefit, how to include uh, uh, storage uh, um, in, 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 in this long-term planning uh, perspective and help us reduce this uncertainty and this risk uh, in our energy uh, transition plan. I hope with uh, the panel can discuss this and, and other um, aspects of resilience in power systems. Thank you very much. I hope you have a great discussion. Hello everyone, I'm Sumanjit Kaur from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and I'll be talking about energy storage needs and challenges for buildings. So let's get started. We have a clear direction. We need to achieve a carbon-free electricity sector by 2035 and a 100% clean energy economy by 2050. In context of buildings, we need to decarbonize the building sector. And at the same time, we need to come up with the solutions which are affordable, which makes our building more resilient and improve the energy efficiency. We need to provide workforce training and support creation of good paying quality, clean energy jobs. We need to advance diversity, equity and inclusion in STEM. At the same time, and equally important, we need to ensure overall benefits of investments are delivered to underserved communities. So let's look at the state of the art of our building. In terms of energy consumption, in US buildings are already the largest electrical load. And with electrical vehicle charging at, uh, on site at buildings, this is going to go up. And if you, divers, if you dissect this energy consumption, you will see that most of this energy is used for meeting thermal loads. Uh, 
So it looks like that to provide solution of energy storage for building, it will be a combination of thermal energy storage and electrochemical energy storage. And it needs to come in many form factor and it has to be a mix of lot of solution. The reason being that buildings uh, is a very large, complex and diverse sector. And this slide that just highlights that. You can have a residential or commercial building, you can have a different use for a building, you can have different type of construction and different occupancy, etc. So what are the solutions we have as of today? In, in the space of electrochemical storage, we, the example here is a power wall by Tesla. And in thermal energy storage solution, we have some uh, water-based energy storage solution out there and some other organic and inorganic phase chain material-based solution. Now, on the cartoon I'm showing here is uh, on the right is that you can have a thermal battery integrated with HVAC or you can have this phase change material integrated into a wall which are uh, connected with the HVAC. So in either, in all, you know, if you combine all of these solutions, the market is very small right now. We have to make this market mainstream. We may need to make that adoption of energy storage for building mainstream. And what needs to be done for that in technical space and in the market space, some of the barriers and challenges are highlighted in this on this slide. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Bye. Hi, I'm Prakash Rao. I'm a scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Today, I'll be giving a lightning talk on energy intense manufacturing. Let's start by defining what we mean by energy intense manufacturing. The chart on the left shows US energy consumption in 2018 broken out by sector. As you can see, energy intense manufacturing refers to six manufacturing subsectors that consume a significant portion of overall US energy demand to the tune of 12%. These six subsectors include petroleum refining, chemicals, cement, iron and steel, food, and paper. In addition to consuming a significant amount of energy, these six subsectors also consume a disproportionately large amount of energy compared to the number of facilities within them. What this means is that any given facility within these six subsectors is likely to be a large user of energy. Diving one step deeper to try to understand how they use energy uh, within these six subsectors, we look at their energy source mix on the right. From this chart, we can see and understand that these are thermally dominated subsectors. We know this because 88% of the energy source mix is from fossil fuels like natural gas or other energy sources that could be used to meet thermal demand like purchased steam. Whereas only 12% of their energy consumption is grid purchased electricity. Here we'd like to show how these six subsectors could leverage the capabilities of energy storage systems. Take, for example, thermal energy storage using latent heat, things like phase change materials. Across the temperature scales, temperature ranges of interest for these six subsectors, the power requirements, and the time scales of interest, latent thermal energy storage has good uh, capabilities. It can meet all the temperature ranges uh, needed by these six subsectors, it can meet the power requirements, and most of the, uh, the most significant time scales of interest. Let's talk too about the challenges associated with energy storage for these subsectors. Energy storage should support decarbonization. That's what we're globally interested in. And it should also improve production without sacrificing safety or compliance. That's important for manufacturers. With that in mind, can the energy storage system be cost effective? One way to think about this is, can energy savings be realized? Things like capturing waste heat, capturing thermal losses, storing them and then using them later could deliver energy savings in addition to energy storage capabilities. Integration. Systems that can be efficiently charged and discharged so that not a lot of the weight, not all the energy is lost will be important. Energy storage systems that don't require significant changes to existing capital equipment, which could become expensive, is also going to be important. And also energy storage systems that don't require the facility to gain new competencies, skill sets, access to markets, environmental permits will also be important. And also a small footprint. Real estate's at a premium on a production floor, so high energy density, high power density are going to be important. 
There's my email address, should you have any questions. I hope to see you all at the Energy, energy Intense Manufacturing panel later on.